Hey guys, welcome back to Final Fantasy XIII, and today we are going to tackle what is straight up the most boring part of the entire game. And that's saying something. Hello everybody, I'm incredibly glad to be on board for this. What, you mean like the Bodum Vestige? Something like yeah, that. we've got a hell of a ride lined up for you yeah, guys well, today. What I don't understand is after the purge and all that we see paranoia, And with a hell of a ride, you mean we best come up with something incredibly entertaining so people don't close it is immediately? This what the wanted us to see? Well, a place for Lassie to I don't know. I think if if someone's managed to stick with it this far, they must have a pretty poor ability to judge what's what's interesting and what's boring. And over skipping through the videos to get to the interesting part. So they're still waiting for that to happen. Well, um, if, if any of those kinds of people are watching, the best part of this video can be found at 27 minutes and 52 seconds. Out of luck. Right, so we have a brief section here where we say Snow is still a little dejected from uh, Barthandel is basically telling him that his big hope was a lie, and they're kind of debating on whether or not they really should believe Dysley. Well, seems that way. I sure don't really see it. what's the debate. Here's your focus on a silver platter. Yeah, I guess so too. I think the big problem with uh, this scene and a lot of them to follow is that they don't actually know if they should follow what the bad guy, who is relatively surely the bad guy, tells them to, but then they do it anyway because they don't really have a choice, and it's a lot of platter about nothing that actually will change. Because the game is too linear. Yeah, they're kind of like inescapably bound to their fate, and by God, are they going to tell us about it? Yeah, and it's not like the corridors aren't linear, guys. You just will have to follow them and see what happens. It's not like you've done anything differently for the last 20 hours. So then, the fifth arc. Yep. We got a brief little section where we can run around and talk to people, but uh, the way forward is out where Fang is. Yes, that was what you were saying before, and will continue to say for the rest of the game. I always think this uh, location here looks like a metro station, and I have no idea why. It Because it basically is. I, I can't think of any better way to describe it. Uh, yeah, but I mean in context of what this is uh, in, in universe, because I don't even know what this is in universe. Yeah, like knowing knowing what we know now, there is no fucking way that it makes any sense at all for there to be a, a train station here. Yeah, and the thing is, as I said, I've, I've watched another Let's Play of this game, and I've played it myself, and I still have no idea where they actually are, how this entire structure looks from the outside or anything. I've always think that, thought that uh, among all of the disconnected locations of this game, this one must be the worst in terms of presenting itself as something that could actually exist somewhere. Yeah, like, we, we, we did see this building from the outside in the cutscene in the end of the last video. Did we? I forgot. Checking your brand? Well, did, was was there was there any any rail bridges going into it? I don't I don't think there were. Well, to be fair, we saw it for all of about ten seconds, if that. So, I mean, not exactly in much time to get a good look at it. Yeah, I've been distracted often when seeing these cutscenes by how bad they are usually. <laughs> but it's it's really I have no idea what this actually is from the outside, and I've never had. Everything a says. He's telling us our focus is to destroy Maybe I'll have to pay attention uh, at the moment we get out in one and a half hours or something. Helping him to do something else. One and a half. Yes. Not yes. We'll, we'll say it takes that long. Yes. That's that would be such a pleasant thing to believe. So Dysley was really the foul sea bar the, the edited one and a half hours. Yes. Do do I even want to know? I don't actually have the raw footage number on hand, but I can assure you it was probably about double that. Uh, yeah, this is, this is really terrible and one of the worst parts in this game for being uh, exactly as bad at stuff as the rest of the game is. Like, it, it's uh, a summary of all of its problems, really. I gotta apologize. Looks like I was wrong. 
even with all the shit that we've put up with so far, this still manages to outdo a lot of it. And it probably comes at the worst part uh, of the game anyway, because you have just been given freedom to change your party. So it's like the game opens up now, guys. And I personally think the Palamisia isn't that bad actually as a dungeon because at least it changes locations a lot and it looks like it could be exciting. And you have three people in your party. But then this here comes and completely destroys all the enthusiasm you could have been building up now. Final Fantasy 13.txt. No, more or less. As I said, this is pretty much the quintessential this is why the game is boring, guys part. Yeah. Let that faith drive you. It even made me I mean, it kind of makes a bad commentary to repeat again and again how incredibly boring this is, but um, I, I think the game itself drives it in. And <laughs> I, I don't, I don't think our viewers who are blo who are going in blind still comprehend how bad this next couple hours is. Although you know what, let's just let's just show. That there's no, there's no need to keep harping on it, because it's, yeah, it's gonna be very obvious very quickly. Bated breath, bated breath. Anyway, the uh, the uh, game here has stuck us with Vanille and Snow, and you know, that's an okay party, but you know everybody wanted Fang and Saws, so that's what we're gonna do. Yeah, I like Fang and Saws mostly because I don't like Snow, Hope, or Vanille, so. I'm with you, that's a good party. I do like Ranil, still do, but I can definitely live with lightning sauces uh, and not snow. So, yeah, this place. I can't believe we're still in Cocoon. It's kinda creepy. I think this is an acceptable part from the looks of it, and it is also, if I remember correctly, done relatively quickly. But I could be misremembering, it's not like I remember anything about this part. I remember something about this part. This is where the game designers remembered that there was still one mechanic that they had yet to introduce, and there was nowhere to introduce it, so they wrote this extremely arbitrary event into this area, and like tried to hand wave it as a way to introduce this new, well, I say new mechanic. A new thing happens. Alright, so very briefly, we have a new enemy here, the Pulsework Knight. Uh, if you remember the Pulsework Soldiers from way the hell back in Chapter 4, they are literally those guys, except with bigger numbers. The, uh, the only difference is that they do have an area of effect attack, which does about, and it does a decent amount of damage, and it's the affected area is pretty big too, but otherwise, yeah, there's... Same guy, bigger numbers, absolutely nothing really to talk about here. Yeah, I also like how the uh, party gets so surprised and intimidated by these guys, at least for a second, because it's not like they haven't fought tons and tons and tons of the same kind of enemies before. Wow. I don't know. Maybe they, maybe they can perceive the numbers and we're like, oh my god, those guys' numbers are really big. Uh, I don't know, we're, we're doing that thing where we're trying to read logic and sense into the actions of characters in Final Fantasy XIII again. Yeah, just mean, uh, if, if they're intimidated by behemoths, uh, that makes more sense. That's, that's funny, you say intimidated by behemoths. LOL. I'm sorry. <gasps> what? Holy shit. So yeah, now we can make everybody every role. For reasons that will be explained in a wonderful post drafted up by Fadol, we will not be doing that until the end of the game. Do you even need a post to say it's just too expensive? Well, that's one of the things. That's one of the things that you say, but it's, we're going to go into a lot more detail there. Yeah, the condensed version, well, you know, we, we might end up saying things about it, because Lord knows there's nothing else to talk about for the next 15 or so minutes. But the really short version is that there's a load of really awesome benefits that you get from doing it, but it's just not practical to do it to any very great extent at any point before pretty much the end of the game. Maybe... If you, like, make a big dedicated effort, you can get one person 
to the very minimal level of one new roll and get just enough benefit out of the cost that you get to make it worth it. So this is basically I know that uh, at, at one point in chapter 11 or so I had done enough uh, mystical things that have not yet happened and will never happen after that and uh, I made one character into a sentinel to help out in my chosen team which I liked. That's about the extent of what I did. I don't know if it actually was really a good idea, but it helped a little, I believe. Yeah, the, the short version is that if you're really, really dedicated, it's probably worth getting Fang, Ravager, Hope, Saboteur, and Saz Sentinel. Outside of that, you are wasting your time. Yeah, I think it is actually Saz, which I did. So I did well. Yeah. It plays into how a couple of very specific mechanics work on the formula level. I haven't penetrated so deeply. I, I usually like reading FAQs and stuff and getting a little into the nitty gritty of things, but I didn't bother much with this game because it's just not worth it, I feel. There are, there are a couple of somewhat slightly interesting things happening under the combat hood in this game. Again, most of which are to do with the things that benefit from having anyone be able to take up any role. I just feel that most of that, in, 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 in that nitty-gritty stuff in this game uh, is hidden behind a gigantic mountain of effort you have to uh, invest in order to make it actually work for you. And this is, this is for example, why I'd say that uh, Lightning is probably the most interesting character to use, because you give her two items, the Axis Blade and the Whistlewind's Calf, as we've already been told, I think, uh, to make her uh, ATB leech movement, where, where she hits guys and then gets more ATB. And that is something that is moderately obvious and easy to do because you just find these items and you can make her into something unique with that. And for almost everyone else, I really don't know of a viable way to do this as quickly and uh, simply. And um, because everything else would require an insane amount of effort and crafting of weapons and stuff and just reading uh, in it in FAQs because there is no way you can uh, realize it for yourself. He said, you can stumble upon some of them by accident. Like, that's what I did with Saz, actually. Uh, Critical Shell is totally useless to him, but that combined with his guns gives him the synthesis ability that makes his buffs last 30% longer. Why Critical Shell? Actually, it's not even Critical Shell, it's Critical Veil, actually. Uh, okay, that one, that one actually kind of makes some sense. Like, uh, I can... But sure as hell makes more sense than it being it coming from Critical Shell. Yeah, it's like the buff thing and some other buff related thing. Um, yeah, but still, I don't think. Uh, I mean, that improves um, his being a synergist, yes. But uh, it, it's not really something that makes him interesting. It likes it. it yeah, it, it improves what he does, and uh, it is not something that Hope, for example, can do. That is nice. But but the ATB thing uh, is directly something that actually makes using lightning in combat a little more fun and you see stuff going up a little better. So I think I prefer that. It's just a, a minor difference, I think. If I still had any faith in this game, you could say that it makes her move like lightning. But I don't, so I won't. We're just, we're just gonna ignore that. Yes, thank you. I'm just gonna ignore that, because I don't have any faith left in this game to seriously assert that that was a thing that they did deliberately. Anyway, um, those yellow balls a while back are circuitrons, and they are literally just bombs, but electric. I like these guys because they are really good if you get one early in 13-2. Yeah. I rocked the entire mid game with one. <laughs> I like 13-2 actually. Yeah. Well, 13-2 will be a hell of a lot more appealing when we don't have this between us and it. Alright, so, uh, another thrilling new enemy here. Thanks. Uh, the... I don't even want to know how to pronounce that, but they're slugs, they cast absorb nutrients, and they steal about 500 HP from you. That's all they do. Noctil you sail. Or Noctil Um, no, I'm pretty sure mine is correct. 
I wouldn't. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not seriously trying to argue. I just actually <laughs> don't know. <laughs> if, if if you say so. Yep. Yeah. The only thing they do is do about 150 damage, and they heal themselves for about the same amount. Well then. It's something that could be more interesting in a game that isn't so oversaturated with numbers because it's like one number they do and you do like eight numbers at the same time so it's completely meaningless at the end of the day. And um, so now we have some flans. Yes, these are the phosphoric ooze. And they are basically mini flans. When they hit you they will inflict poison and if you leave them alone long enough, they will actually merge together and make a much bigger, more dangerous flan. Huh. That's almost interesting. I do think that these are interesting enemies, yes. Yeah, and, they, it, and it gets really dicey when you're in a fight that has like four of the slugs and four of the, uh, the flans, because it's like, you know, do you focus on the guys who are constantly stealing your health, or the ones who are trying to merge? It's, it's a cool little thing. Yeah, some of these fights here in the beginning are legitimately hard and challenging because of uh, decisions like that, and uh, this is really a part where you can't just mash X to win the game, as a lot of people have said. Yeah, I don't... I, I can kind of understand why people would make the mistake of thinking that this is that kind of game, especially if, you know, they make that judgement based on the first two hours. But... This is the point where that assertion really starts to fall apart. Most definitely, but people who think that hitting X to win the game uh, is, is a good idea probably didn't penetrate uh, up to here. And, I mean, who could really blame them? Yeah, that's fair. I, I think uh, the, the game kind of requires you to actually um, actively try and make it fun, because it certainly isn't on its own. Um, I, I personally, for example, I switch paradigms far more often than you do just to have some buttons to press. I don't know if it is actually more uh, of a good thing or not, because you always have that one first switch that, eh, you know? Yeah, well, yeah, there, there is that, there is that, um, what is it, eight, 8 seconds, 12 seconds thing, where if you, if you wait between paradigm shifts, then when you shift, you get a full... I exactly for that reason, yes. Because I... Right, yeah, the gist... Yeah, it's... It, I don't think anyone really knows exactly what it is, but the gist of it is you want to wait about two full ATB bars, and then switch. Isn't the amount of time... Well, unless you have haste. Isn't the amount of time it takes to fill up the bar, like, constant, no matter how many segments you have? So, in theory, it's an amount of time in seconds anyway. I, that I honestly don't know. I'm pretty sure that haste screws with a, a twice filled up timing, so you have to wait a little longer. At least it's my experience because I constantly use that as said. Uh, it makes it a little more engaging to say, okay, now two ATPs full, I switch from aggression to uh, relentless assault and back again. Uh, on the other hand, you know, a relentless assault is really good, so you should probably just switch between two relentless assaults too. Yeah, that's a, that's a thing that you can do, by the way. You can have identical paradigms. Yeah, but on the other hand, you only have six paradigms. So, I mean, this is actually something that is legitimately interesting to think about, and uh, this is the first time where you can really play around with it. It's just a crying shame that this area is not fun to play around in. Yeah, that, that last fight especially, because that, that was uh, three of the little flans and four of the slugs, and that fight will fuck you up if you're not careful. By the way, you may, you may have noticed we went, like, uh, we went down a couple levels and we went through another train station. But this, this whole place seems to be like full of rails, which makes no sense, given where we're supposed to be. Yeah, that, that sure happened. They just all jumped right over me. Yeah, this game sometimes, I don't know. I think you did find the safe passage in between them. But this is like the perfect fight uh, if you're having trouble to bust out a summon. It's also something that su uh, makes the fight somewhat interesting because uh, summons aren't actually that bad, they just have a niche use you have to find out sometimes. Yeah, I... I'm gonna use. So I know we haven't. We haven't. I haven't really had a good opportunity to show off a lot of the summons. So I know so far I've really only used uh, lightnings and snows. 
Yeah, can you change leader now? I don't even know. Yes, yes, ah, you can okay. change so, so now it's actually the first time you can choose who uh, you want to summon with. I, 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 it's, this is this is probably a terrible idea, but I like I considered that we might try having like a, th a thread vote to pick one character and one secondary role for them to learn, because we sure as hell won't have the resources to do much more than that forever. Yeah, like I said, there's really and there's really only three of them that are really really useful anyway. It's mostly just you want to pick up an extra sentinel and you want to get Fang Ravager. Oh, I don't know. We can totally make Lightning a saboteur. Nothing I can't handle. That's totally a good idea. All right, so uh, these guys, the Stinkini and the Skyne. Skatane, Sk I want to say. It's it's sti Stinkini, but not Stinkini, but it's funny. <laughs> Alright, anyway, uh, these guys are basically reskins of the Incubus and Succubus from back in Chapter 4. Uh, they... The Stinkini uses uh, debuffs, specifically they will throw out uh, Pain, Fog, and Daze. All of which are awful. Yeah, they completely stop you from using physical attacks, magic attacks, or anything at all. So that's so you really want to knock them out immediately. Yeah, the soul saving grace of Daze is that it never lasts very long. It usually usually when enemies put it on you, it lasts just long enough for them to get like one specific attack on you without you being able to do anything about it. Yeah, these are really and Sorry, go ahead. I'm gonna say the Stakanes are just they just do a physical attack combo. It does a fair amount of damage, but it's nothing too dangerous. Yeah, but I think these, the problem with these fights is that um, if they land a daze or a pain or whatever it's called uh, really early in the fight, then you can be in a serious amount of trouble because all of that is of course luck on their side. Um, but I if they don't, you can take out the debuffer really quickly and have no problems whatsoever. Uh, but this is not that much of a problem because the fights of course can be easily retried if something really bad happens. Like them immediately targeting your leader before you can do anything about it. Game design! Uh, this is definitely one of these fights where if, if two of the Skatanis uh, focus on your leader, you can just die within milliseconds. And I think it was here where I had a fight where uh, I tried it like three or four times and they always immediately focused on the leader and I just had to make sure to instantly summon. Is the closest this area gets to interesting, which is not very close, but it has colors at least. Yeah, these guys. They are annoying. Alive. What's the sanctum up to? And hilariously overdesigned, much like a lot of the other enemies. Oh, the artist literally had nothing else to do. Also, this room is seriously, unironically called the Hibernatorium. That sure is a construction of the English language. <sighs> Alright, so... This is the Berserker. He is a hilariously inflated sack of HP, and that's really all that matters about him. Yeah, notice we, uh, we've we got him staggered. We're dealing you know, increasingly close to double damage already. And... Coming up on quad damage here, actually. Uh, yeah. But... Yeah, this... I guess technically he does have a gimmick, and we'll actually see it in the next fight, because like hell am I gonna let him get it off here. But... Just... He just has so much health. Yeah, this is a terrible fight and enemy design in general, uh, because it really doesn't need all of that health. It, he can get off his gimmick easily with at least half its health. Uh, this this is this is some fucking Bioshock Infinite levels of too much health here. All right, they say, watch this. This okay. Notice he's already down to about two thirds HP, and now I'm gonna bust out Cerberus. Now, in case anyone's forgotten, when all three people are commandos, everyone is getting a big bonus to damage, and they're all what level level two three? They're all level three commandos. Yeah. So level level three commandos, I think, 
get passively something like a, a plus 200% boost to their own damage output. And I want to say like 15, 20% to their allies. I, I, I've got the numbers around here somewhere. I think this is a fight where I would uh, argue that uh, switching after two Cerberus turns into two turns of uh, Realms as Assault or Aggression uh, would have maybe made him go down within that one stagger bar because the Relentless Assault turns would have pushed the damage to like 600% or whatever. And you would have gotten the free ATBs. Yeah, you can get more turns off and you can get the stagger up while also dealing hella damage. But uh, yeah, so that took him down to about maybe a fifth HP after that full run of Cerberus. That's... That's not enough. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not enough. He should have died on the second stagger. I mean, of course you're getting off um, a back attack in that case um, should make it far easier, but it really doesn't. It, it really doesn't take off much of the time. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't help that enemies. You know, when you when you get a stagger off of a of a preemptive strike, it doesn't last quite as long just due to the way the mechanics play out. Yeah, it, if you can get a commando in there quick enough, it will last a lot longer. But that's you got to be quick on it. Anyway, uh, here's his gimmick. When he uses Forge Blade, he will summon a sword, and it will attack you on its own. And if you kill it, you will summon another one, and just rinse and repeat. Yeah, I'm still not entirely sure if it's worth uh, focusing on them and all the sword, uh, especially when he has already gotten the stagger up a lot while he's forging the sword, but I think it kind of depends on the type of berserker, because also, of course these guys will be reskinned to Helen back later on. Uh, so yeah, there's um, that's the Berserkers, and there's about 12 of those things in this fucking place. So here's a new kind of weapon class, the Staggerlock weapon. It has all around amazing stats, but it has the Staggerlock ability on it. So while the character can like increase the chain gauge, they can't actually stagger enemies, they have to leave that to someone else. Basically, have one person in your party with stagger lock, and you'll be fine. <laughs> 